Today we are going to cover Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788-1860. He was a German philosopher, and his main work had to do with will. The will meaning the motivator. He wrote a book called The World as Will and Representation. He is probably one of the more depressing philosophers of the year, um, but his solution to the depression of our lives, I think, is pretty applicable for many. So, the will to live, that's the main concept that Schopenhauer keeps coming back to. He says there is one main motivation, it's our only desire, and it's going to control all of humanity. All of our behavior is going to be controlled by this will to live, or continue to live. He called it a force within us, so powerful, beyond just our reason, our logic, our morals, he called it the will to live. So we will talk about what this is. What is he trying to talk about when he talks about will? He's saying that inner desire, that thing in us. You wake up one day and you just have a desire, maybe for another person, maybe for a career change. He said a lot of times this will is not something we can control. It's a blind impulse. It's illogical, meaning it does not make any sense. It's insistent. It will never shut up. It's the thing that drives us inside. It is a motivating factor, but in the eyes of Schopenhauer, it was a motivating factor that made our lives full of suffering. Actually, I never had any desire to go into that field until they built that fence. All I have to do in class is say, do whatever you guys want, but don't look at that back window. And half the kids have a desire to look at the back window. That drive within you almost to say, why? Why can't I look at it? He said that there is no point behind this will, behind this desire. It is insistent and it will control and dictate all of our actions and our motivations. When you really examine why you're upset, it's because of this will or desire within you that cannot be fulfilled. In regards to relationships, that's really what he was looking at in regards to will. He called it, the, the will to live was a force that made us want to survive through reproduction. We look for a mate and all of our energies, all of our drive is, while we think it's pursuit of happiness, it really isn't. And the fact is, this inner drive causes things like happiness and love and peace of mind usually not to be fulfilled. They're usually not achieved. And people wonder why. A man can do what he wants, but not want what he wants. Well, you could say, I want what I want, but that's not really true. At least in my case, it's not. I can't speak for your inner motivations, but one day you just have a mood for something. And maybe that mood is more than a mood. Maybe it's a desire, a drive that makes you unhappy as long as that desire is unfulfilled. It's most clearly seen in relationships. You can be um, going out with someone and then they break up with you or maybe you never had a chance to go out with them. And even though rationally it makes sense to move on, you can't. You cannot want what you want. It's given to you. It's the will, according to Schopenhauer. So he actually sees the will not really only as a motivation, but more as a big problem of humanity. He says we are always so full of desire, we're never satisfied. You can imagine the kid going down in the grocery store in the basket with his mom and say, oh, mom, please give me the cookies. I'll never ask for anything again as long as I live. And then next aisle over, he wants some Funyuns or just give me a pony. We always have this insatiable. It can never be, uh, can never be finished. We, we can't be ever satisfied. These pictures are three walls in my spare room of CDs. I have over 17,000 CDs. I haven't listened to a CD in years, but each CD I got would give me, it would fulfill a desire, and then the next day I'd want another one. Insatiable. We can never get to the bottom of our will, of our desire, and he saw that as a big problem. He sees ultimately being alive as being a source of eternal frustration. We're always going to be frustrated because we're always endlessly going to strive for nothing in particular. In other words, when we achieve what we want, then there's something else we want. There's always this will behind it that drives us oftentimes into places that are not making peace of mind possible. And the best, biggest example of this all, obviously, is in relationships. A very depressing quote. Life swings like a pendulum, backwards and forwards, 
between pain and boredom. I don't really have to comment on that. You might think that's true or not, but uh, Schopenhauer, usually when you see him in pictures, he looks like a man who is eternally bothered. Maybe it's the hair. I'm not sure. Sex, love, and children. Well, he said, if you really examine it, sex, love, and having children are our primary drivers of the will to live, and it's going to lead to us being miserable. He ultimately said, it's not an accident that we are unhappy. Biology is stronger than reason. Now, what does that mean? He says we are attracted to people who probably aren't going to make us happy and aren't conducive to long-term marriage or relationships. All you have to do is a show of hands of how many kids have gone through divorce, and it appears that oftentimes uh, relationships don't work out. So why do we fall in love with who we fall in love with? Why do we have this will? Schopenhauer says, subconsciously, what we're actually doing when we're attracted to someone, when we choose our mate, we're actually subconsciously thinking this person has a strength in some area where I have a weakness, and when we get together and have our kids, the, my strength and your weakness are going to balance themselves out. Well, that picture on the right's a bit extreme, but the idea, uh, if someone's shy, they tend to be attracted to outgoing people. And maybe the idea, you may have heard of opposites attract, that's the concept. He said it's a subconscious drive in us to make the better offspring, if you will. When we, we are driven to fall in love with someone who will cancel out our imperfections in our children. And that's the idea behind his whole concept. This will to live is beyond us. It just continues from generation to generation. The person we get with, we're not going to be happy with, but maybe we'll make better balanced children with. If you fall in love again, I'll kick your arse. The idea, ultimately, I love the picture of the heart just kind of goofy looking, because the heart will basically stumble into things, and the mind says, why are you doing this? But oftentimes, the mind does not have the power to get the heart straight. He said, as we said, quiet people might be attracted to outgoing, confident people attracted to shy. It's going to make a balanced baby, but we're never going to have long-term happiness. In fact, according to Schopenhauer, we should not be surprised by marriages between people who would never have actually been friends. Love casts itself on people who, apart from sex, would be hateful, contemptible, and even abhorrent to us. In other words, we do, would not like them. But the will of the species is so much more powerful than that of individuals that lovers overlook everything, misjudge everything, and bind themselves forever to an object of misery. So it's the idea of the heart is the will and the mind has no ability to steer it in the right direction. Now a positive, if you will, to take out of Schopenhauer's super negative view of relationships and the will desire that drives us is that it's normal, according to Schopenhauer, to be unhappy in your relationship. Survival of the species is what's important, not your personal happiness. That's not what life is about, according to Schopenhauer. If we begin to understand and accept this fact, and we can maybe lower our expectations for happiness with the other person, we will ultimately suffer less when the bad relationship occurs. As Schopenhauer says, happiness was never part of this master plan. We are attracted to who we're attracted to, we make our offspring, and then oftentimes you're not that thrilled with your partner, according to Schopenhauer. It is difficult to find happiness within oneself, but it's impossible to find it anywhere else. Well, you might be noticing a couple of these concepts, the idea of desire, the idea of happiness within yourself. Schopenhauer was exposed to Buddhism, and although I don't think he really understood it fully, this concept right here is true. It's hard to find happiness, but you can find it within yourself through your method of thinking and your perspective. Another quote, and I've referenced this earlier in the year, a man's delight in looking forward to and hoping for some particular satisfaction is part of the pleasure flowing out of it, enjoyed in advance. But this is afterwards deducted for the more we look forward to anything, 
the less we enjoy it when it comes. If you're sitting in my class or some other class so bored, so miserable, keep looking at the clock, and then you think of the big party coming up in two weeks, and you start having expectations for how great it is, you will bring satisfaction in that moment through your imagination of the event. And then when the event gets here, you're probably not going to enjoy it as much because you have, through expectations, maybe ruined it. And in the idea of Schopenhauer, you've deducted a lot of the happiness from it in advance. So as I talked about, Schopenhauer did, uh, in some ways, he was exposed to Buddhism, and his connection between desire and suffering is there. The idea of the will is, we have will, it drives us illogically, and it causes us suffering. But see, Buddhism is a little bit different. Buddhism says, isn't overwhelmingly negative, it just accepts the fact that when we suffer, it's because of desire. And Buddhism tries to get you to minimize your emotions and your uh, dramatic stories that we tell ourselves and fill our heads with so that we could be more accepting of the moment. Schopenhauer wasn't having that. Schopenhauer, in the ideas of many, in court of Nietzsche, he had a pessimistic view. Nietzsche called it Western Buddhism. The idea of if you separate yourself from your will, you will reduce your suffering. But it's impossible. You can't get rid of desire. If you're trying to get rid of desire, you have desire to get rid of it. It's impossible to separate yourself. Schopenhauer was basically saying life is full of suffering. There is no doubt that life is given us not to be enjoyed, but to be overcome, to be got over. So depressing. But to some degree, when you overcome something, you do uh, achieve uh, some sort of satisfaction from it. So here is where Schopenhauer finally steers the boat maybe in a positive direction. He says, you know what, the will and the desire is going to cause you an unhappy life full of suffering and pain, but if you look at music and you look at art in a certain way, they can be a portal or a path or a way out so that we can forget our troubled, miserable existences and find some peace in art or in music. When we really get involved, when we immerse ourselves in that moment, we can escape, as he said, the shackles of everyday life. In other words, you've got a mortgage, you've got an unhappy marriage, you've got the nine to five, you know, five days a week, your whole life lifestyle. But maybe you can go to a concert or go to a museum and for that brief amount of time, you can get away from your suffering and you can reach a different place of peace. Music is the answer to the mystery of life, according to Schopenhauer. The most profound of all the arts, it expresses the deepest thoughts of life. I'm a big music fan, obviously you saw the previous slide. When I listen to music, it can take me to a different place, and it really can speak to me in a way that words can't. It kind of bypasses the mind and it goes to the heart, in my opinion at least. So he thought that music was timeless, universal language. And you think about it, you can listen to Bach or Mozart, ancient, you know, 400 years old, and they still have the same power. And in the idea of um, Schopenhauer, they can transcend our will. They can go beyond our will. They can make us forget our will for a moment. Or maybe you could contemplate, look at a work of art, really get into it. Work of art could be a book, could be a movie, could be music, could be art. And maybe you can use it to get a different perspective that might make your life a little less painful and full of suffering. I don't know if you agree or disagree with this. A lot of kids, I, I think, do find music as a portal. Just the idea of putting your headphones on as a way to block out the outside world. When you find that music that speaks to you, it might, in those moments when you're listening to it, get you out of your dissatisfied, miserable condition, which is obviously caused by your mindset. Now, he went a little bit deeper. He talked about ethics, and he talked about egotism versus compassion. He said that our actions, now we talked about will as our motivation, but he said our actions are guided by one of three things. Either egoism, malice, which is mean, like hateful, like trying to hurt someone else, or through compassion. The majority of men are not capable of thinking, but only of believing, and are not accessible to reason, but only to authority. His view of mankind was quite negative, and his view of why we act the way we act, in terms of egotism and, and malice, continues that trend. So an egotistical act, obviously, 
is an act that's guided by your own self-interest. You want to bring as much happiness and pleasure as you can to yourself. There's nothing wrong with that, potentially, unless we do it all of the time to, so that we actually block out everyone else. He said, most of our actions are truly egotistical. We're just looking out after ourselves, even to the degree of giving a present to someone else and wanting them to know it came from us. It's still driven by ourselves, our own ego. And he saw that ultimately egoism is one of the main reasons why we don't act morally. We do things that are wrong because they benefit us. We might, you know, lie to get out. We might cheat to get something for ourselves. When I asked the question, how many kids have cheated in class? Almost everybody raises their hand. And I write everybody's name down and send them to the principal. <laughs> Schopenhauer explains with egotistical acts. By its nature, man has an unqualified desire to have the greatest possible amount of well-being and pleasure of which he's capable. Accordingly, everyone makes himself the center of the world. Whatever occurs, for example, the great changes in the fate of a nation, is first referred to his interests. However small and indirect these may be, they are thought of before anything else. If you recall our discussion of Buddhism, the opposite of compassion and the sort of interconnected is to sort of be stuck in your own sort of alienated world, not realizing the connection to everything else. The second type of action is simply malice. They're different from egotistical actions because we actually want to cause damage to others. Maybe for our own benefit or maybe just to push someone else down so we feel better about ourselves. Obviously, this is the, the most negative of his three main ideas of ethics. And the final one is compassion, which I think he also probably pulled from Buddhism. He says it's very seldomly used. Of the three, most people don't act through compassion. He actually goes and makes a distinction between a just person and a good person. A good person being a higher up. And it's not, uh, you don't come up with a description between just and good based on actions, but by their compassion. Now, what does that mean? He says the just person, they begin to see that maybe our inner selves, our inner being, that we exist in every little thing, that we are all one and the same ent entity. We, we feel bad for the other person because, you know what, they've got a similar experience to us. But a good person, in the opinion of Schopenhauer, is one person who completely agrees and understands that when he sees suffering in others, he wants to end that. He understands the concept that we are all one on one level, and that a person who truly is uh, motivated by compassion doesn't just want to avoid harming people, but he wants to take away the suffering of others, who actually acts to make others' lives better, not for his own purpose, but for the greater good of humanity. Uh, Einstein quote, as we segue into the second part, I agree with Schopenhauer that one of the most powerful motives that attracts people to science and art is the longing to escape from everyday life. Which brings us to aesthetics. Aesthetics is art. It's the philo philosophical study of what is art. So aesthetics tries to answer some of the big questions. What is art? What makes a piece of art beautiful? How important is your personal taste when art is being judged? Is art's beauty objective or subjective? Subjective means it's an opinion. Objective is no, 100%. That is beautiful. Or is originality even important in art? Is original and creativity better? I mean, one of the greatest artists of all time is a, plagi uh, a plagiarer who is able to copy almost every artist's style and make a painting that literally sells as if it's a lost Van Gogh. He's not creative in that he is copying other styles and he actually went to jail or at a major fine, but I would say he's one of the best artists who's ever lived, but he wasn't creative. He was sort of just emulating others. So art, a, de a definition, the product of creative human activity in which materials are shaped or selected to convey an idea, emotion, or visually interesting form. Here is the Sistine Chapel of Michelangelo. So what makes art art? Well, first, it probably hopefully shows some technical ability, so you got some skills. Hopefully, it's enjoyable, so that it brings enjoyability to the person who looks at it. Maybe it, it conveys the feelings, and it gets those feelings across to the person who views it. Maybe it brings some sort of lesson, moral lesson, that might help us live a better life. And in, just, in general, maybe it's just beautiful. 
And finally, maybe it helps us get a better insight or understanding into how reality works. So, subjectivity of art. The earliest philosophers we covered this year, Socrates and Plato, they said that beauty is objective. It's a matter of fact. Something is beautiful or it's not. If you don't think it's beautiful, then you are wrong. It does not give the idea of uh, Socrates and Plato, it does not give wiggle room for opinions. Now, later philosophers begin to become a little more subjective. The idea, you may have heard the idea of the eye of the beholder, that we have our own taste on things and we can judge what's beautiful and not beautiful. The eye of the beholder thing is probably the, the best phrase you've heard. Most people will look at a picture and I'd say if it's a beautiful picture, a, a Van Gogh or a Dolly or whatever it is, I'd say 90% are going to say it's beautiful, but maybe 10% think it's awful and would rather look at something that others think is ugly. So our earliest philosophers, Plato, you might remember, he thought art should be censored. He saw, thought art should be controlled by the philosopher kings and the state because art can shape people's character. I mean, just look at music and how music is such a major influencer in our society. He felt that painters and artists should make beautiful objects to educate people and push them in a direction of being kind or gentle or peaceful, while ugly art, you know, could be seen as dangerous. You know, in a true freedom of speech, where you have freedom of art, some art is, is uh, negative to others. I mean, the fame, Mabel Thorpe, if you were to look him up, a lot of his art actually offended people. Plato felt that art should be controlled, and they should be under control of the philosophers, the philosopher kings, rather, and used almost as advertising to kind of encourage people. So lots of pretty pictures to keep people happy. Plato's student Aristotle, you might remember, had a different view entirely. He thought art was to teach us things, profound truths, to basically, he called it a cathartic effect, the good cry. You watch The Notebook when you just got broken up with, and you have a good cry. That idea that it brings emotion to you, he felt that art, and back then it was dramas in terms of plays, he felt that watching a tragedy uh, uh, acted out on the stage might give us more compassion for others. And so while Plato thought art should be controlled, Aristotle thought that art could definitely help shape people through seeing potentially negative things at times. Then you got Nietzsche. Nietzsche thought art was to be was to involve death and destruction a lot of times, to focus on myths. He thought being unhappy is good for us, because unhappy will challenge us. He felt maybe it's better to be sad and deep than just to be happy and superficial. And when you think about it, a lot of the, the prettiest pictures we kind of think is boring, but something that pushes the envelope, that would be the sort of thing that would interest Nietzsche in terms of art and his mustache. He hoped that maybe art would focus us to have courage and to move forward, to overcome. So maybe a dark picture would, would motivate us in some form or fashion. So what is the purpose of art? Art is emotion. Well, when you look at it, art usually a lot of times, I don't know necessarily this painting I'm not familiar with, but a lot of inner emotions, feelings, moods, we can kind of understand where the artist is coming from, that that the ultimately these moods that are expressed in the painting might affect us, the audience, and motivate us in some form or fashion. Poetry, you know, uses metaphors to try to, try to bring emotion across to the reader. And rock music, which I'm sure people are more familiar with than, than poetry, can evoke a reaction. You might be doing the headbanging thing and, and use up your energy. Or back in the 80s, people used to do this pogo slam dancing thing to work off a lot of their angst. Music and art in different ways can bring cross emotions to people who are viewing and experiencing it. Intense emotion. Now, some of these paintings you probably have seen. The one on the bottom is Guernica by Picasso. That shows the Spanish Civil War. It's a number of uh, different figures ripping themselves about. And a lot of times, uh, intense emotions like the scream in the top right can, can really can, can hit at your soul and really maybe move you in the way that a pretty picture maybe wouldn't. Art is social commentary. Now, this picture on the bottom is a Holocaust-based picture of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Some art, if used as social commentary, it can get us to be more aware of a problem. It can create a conversation. Conversations are good because differences of views are exchanged. And maybe this conversation might cause a different perspective in someone's eyes, might influence change within them. 
Here are some pictures. Um, the idea in the top right is an example of a Banksy. I think it is Banksy. I remember when all this was trees. And the other ones, they're social commentary. The idea of, you know, the leaded and unleaded in the bottom uh, right, which is Flint, Michigan, and you see the little black girl drinking the leaded because they had lead in the pipes. Or the idea of the little child, even a little age, looking up at all the Coca-Cola and McDonald's imagery. Or Facebook, we're praying at the altar of Facebook while we issue all of our, you know, views on life. Social commentary art can really maybe challenge us, criticize society with satire. Propaganda, I mean, the famous Rosie the Riveter in the bottom left with the We Can Do It or the Uncle Sam can motivate people for the war effort or whatever it is. Propaganda in art form is, um, it's art, but it definitely is conveying a message, hopefully. And finally, art, when most people think of it, it's just creating beauty. And so the concept of Schopenhauer, he saw life as being miserable, mainly because of a drive within us. But he said if we can find art and music, we maybe can find a way out of that misery just for a brief amount of time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please write a journal, and I will talk to you soon.